Carlos here, and I have Campfire Audio's Cascade. Now, this is an interesting one. It just arrived, and I'm going to unbox it. Now, uh, Ken Ball of uh, Campfire Audio, or ALO Audio as originally known, he as well, he's been around you know the, the scene for a very long time. He's a very interesting guy because he's kind of gone backwards in a sense from most manufacturers. Now, most manufacturers have, uh, you know, they make a pair of headphones or IEMs, and then they get into making equipment. Uh, you know, like uh, amps or DACs or what have you, and then they get into making, uh, you know, cables. And, and Ken's kind of gone backwards in that because he has first he made cables, uh, starting on Headfire, aftermarket cables for headphones, and then he got into making, uh, in conjunction with other manufacturers such as Red Wine Audio, made uh, amps and DACs, and was kind of one of the big guys in the, the, the portable amp DAC scene before uh, digital portable players became a big deal, and then. He got into making IEMs, and we've already seen the, uh, the Andromeda's and the Vegas, and the Vegas are very important because uh, these are, you know, these are Ken's first headphones, and it's quite a big deal for him. Four years in the making, and the Vegas are kind of the basis of the tuning of these. It's interesting because, you know, there are a lot of headphones which are under five hundred dollars, and a lot of headphones which are over a thousand dollars. But there wasn't so many, there weren't so many pairs of headphones that were. You know, in between that five hundred to a thousand dollars, and I remember the Hi-Fi Man HE five thousands. They were a really big deal. Uh, they took a, they a lot of people really loved those headphones. They were I think originally nine ninety nine, same price as the Odyssey LCD twos, and then they ended up at uh, I think it was six ninety nine or seven ninety nine. I think it may have been six. I don't remember, but they dropped a few hundred dollars, and then it, it, heaps of them were sold, and they were very popular headphones, and people really liked them. I was just talking to someone the other day who really liked them. So we have Mr. Speakers came out with the Eons, and now we have um, and there have been a few other pairs of headphones. You know, Sony's uh, MDR Z sevens, but they've dropped down kind of to below the five hundred dollar mark retail. So although they're they're floating around cheaply anyway. But you know, there's that that again that mark that point between five hundred and thousand dollars. You know, something unique, like the Eons. Uh, you know, the manufacturers have had choices. Do they do they try and make something more you know like conventional but you know higher priced like the Sony's, or do they try and take high end headphones and, and bring them down to below the thousand dollar mark as Hi-Fi Man has done, as Mr. Speakers have done, and you know this is uh, Ken's answer to that. And I'm, I'm actually really keen to check these out. So. Ken has sent me along a pair to, to review. Now, uh, I saw, I tried to prototype at one of the Tokyo shows a few years back, but this is, you know, this is the, this is the final, and I've no idea what to expect. So, they're not, I remember Ken was inspired, he used, to, I owned a couple of pairs of his uh, recabled and, and damped it, uh, ALO, um, the Ultrasound Edition 9s. And Ultrasound, you know, if you want a pair of high-end, you know, close backs, you go and get a pair of ultrasones. But, you know, they kind of were more style over performance ultimately. So they've kind of dropped out of the enthusiast market. I mean, there are a lot of people who still like them, but, you know, plenty of people who don't like them either. And so to have, you know, a pair of kind of entertaining sounding close backs is, is, is really interesting. Now, I gather they come with some, some accessories. I've only just sort of glanced in the fine details of what's, what we've ended up with. Some tuning adjustment. Now, I'll get into this later, but you can, according to, to Ken, you can tune these slightly with different inserts by taking off the, the pads. We have our instructions, what's this? Damper tuning guide and information about the, the headphones. Let's have a quick look at the damper tuning guide. We have <clears throat> four tunings with notch identifications and different pore sizes, so they should have different effects, as we'll see. And we have a warranty card. That's that for there. So tuning I'm glad for. I mean, Mr. Speakers have done that. I find the, they found the Eons maybe a touch dark for my preferences, so these will be more lively. Now, apparently these use a, a Litz wire cable too. Now, Ken being a cable guy, I think was, you know, some people are going to disagree with me, obviously. I think it's partly why his IEMs sounded so good. He started off with good wire to begin with. Because some of the wires you know, I had on IEMs tended to add harshness. And again, people disagree with me, but that's cool. Now, before I get into the sound, I'd like to go over the ergonomics of these headphones a bit. Now, they are designed, obviously, as a portable. You know, they fold, but still they're built very strongly. Uh, for starters, for reliability, they use HD800 connectors on the cables. And this is going to be more reliable than your kind of four-pin micro XLR plug and socket. And although they're a pain to solder, uh, Ken has found that they tend to be more reliable. Now, build quality is pretty excellent. I mean, check out, for example, these hinges. 
If I bring it up to the camera, you can see, you know, the really nice metal work of these hinges. Uh, everything's, you know, solidly made, uh, solidly assembled. Even like if, if I really hunt for imperfections, there are only really maybe the, the tiniest imperfections on there, which, you know, I, wouldn't be noticeable. They're kind of 99% there in terms of that. Maybe the, the, if I were to be really picky, I could say maybe the, the head pad is maybe a, t a touch uneven, but the, the ear pads are really nice. Um, generally, overall, this this screwed together, you know, pretty nicely, which is what you want to see, really, especially for something you want to last for maybe you know at least a decade for for use with your portable system. Now, the ear pads, you know, they're they're nice, thick, and and plush and comfortable. And later, I'll show you how they pop on and off, and they're you know, nice and deep. And that's good because when you open these up, you find that the the kind of ergonomics of the head band itself. If you look at the shape, and I'll turn them around the, the right way for you, not the right way for me. If you look at the head headband, the, the shape is kind of a little bit odd. So the clamping force ends up being, once you open them up, a little bit strong. And it's only because, I, I guess, because of these uh, thick ear pads that it doesn't become too uncomfortable. Although the first day I used them, I did get a bit of a headache, but it's hard to say because it was listening or, you know, exactly what the cause of that was. But they it, do find the clamping pressure a little bit strong. And the head pad, now the other thing about that is it's, thinner than average compared to you know other headphones. For, for example, if I uh, get a pair, I've got a Mastrop Focal LX here, you can see it's actually, the, the, the head pad front to back is actually thinner. So the result of that is that there's less area to, to sit on your head and they, it tends to be a little bit more uncomfortable than uh, you know most regular headphones. Now in that, once you fold them up because the ear pads are, are quite thick, I think Ken could have just done with a normal thick, normal front to back thickness of this, and it would have been fine because, you know, in the end, there's still it's still a fair you know fair about 10 centimeters thickness that you've got to put away anyway. So I don't think the, having it thinner, you know, makes them any more portable. But speaking of the ear pads, the dimensions of these ear pads, the, if you've got really large ears, this is gonna be a little bit troublesome. They're four centimeters to six centimeters internally. So I've got just pull off one of the, the ear pads of the, um, the uh, LX. And you can see like it's got a five by six and a half centimeter opening compared to the, uh, compared to the uh, Cascade. So bigger opening there. But if you do, again, if you do have large, if you have trouble with anything like a, a Focal, you're really gonna have trouble with these. As again, it's just gonna be, the ear pads will just be too small. It does make me wonder if down the track, like other manufacturers, they're gonna go for making a larger, Ken's gonna go for making larger ear pads. I actually hope he makes a full size pair of these, but I'll talk about that later. Now, speaking of that cable, of course, that it is really, really very small cable. I mean, if you look at the HD800 connectors on there, you can get an idea of just how small this cable is. If it's not readily apparent, I have some other aftermarket HD800 cables here, which I, you know, I've been listening with. So, for example, we have our make it here so you can sit our Norn cable, which has bazillions of connectors, bazillions of wires in it, um, pretty massive. We have ALO's own uh, Reference 16, which is a big, chunky, heavy cable as well. We have the um, the Kimber cable, which is very expensive and has massive wooden connectors on them. And it's a good thing because, you know, this has a, you know, very big forward angle on the connectors. So even these big connectors aren't an issue. <laughs> I mean, how far out is that? You could just about stick a boom mic on there so far out. But anyway, you know, look, at, look how small the cable is in comparison. It's just tiny. And they do have other cables. They don't have a 2.5 millimeter at the moment, but they do have a 4.4 millimeter. So if you want to use them with a Sony DAP, that's going to be really lovely. Have a look at the shape of the cups versus the, the Focal cans, which I pulled the ear pad off. Notice that these, that the, the bottom of the pads are touching, whereas in these Focals, they're not. Now, if you want a really extreme comparison, I have a pair of Sony Z7s here. Look at the difference. And the Sony's, of course, are the winners for comfort. We'll just get that right out of the way. Sony's really nailed it on that one, but look at the massive difference in shape. Well, anyway, you'll see them on my head in a bit, and I'll give you an idea of how they, um, how they look. But um, next on to the sound. One of the things I wanted to do with the Cascades is see how well they scaled. And so to that end, I've got a number of low-end devices I tried them with, such as the Blue Wave Get. Uh, you know, I've got a Hi-Fi Man 
uh, Mega Mini here, which I've been using with uh, Al Audio's Continental V5, for example, as a portable kit. Now, plugging into some, this kind of device or just out of the Mega Mini, now the Mega Mini is a nice little, po little pocket DAP, but it hasn't got a lot of drive, and neither has a Blue Wave, uh, neither the Blue Wave definitely doesn't have much drive at all. And so out of these devices, you know, you can still get very still get good sound, but the, the bass, for example, especially considering they're very bass strong headphones, was kind of boomy and out of control. You know, plugging them into the Continental V5, you know, improved things considerably. But what was interesting, of course, you plug them into a much nicer depth, say, you know, at least a Mojo or, you know, one of the Astle and Kern depths. That really boosted up, boosted up the sound quality and the, and the resolution. So there was a really big difference in, in using them with, say, a portable system or using them on my home system where there was a, a great deal more detail and control and, and, and spaciousness in the music. And that was really great because to know that they can scale up be, beyond this stuff but still sound really good with this stuff was uh, really what I wanted to hear from you know a pair of portable headphones. And so I spent actually some time enjoying this combination rig even though I wasn't getting a, a massive amount of detail as there was enough control enough control of the drivers to be able to enjoy listening. The Cascades are a lot of fun to listen with and I found myself picking them up pretty much every day and listening with them. They brought out the best in a lot of music and they have, given that they have quite a strong bass, much like the Vegas do, this worked with some music quite well and was kind of a mixed blessing and, and some music not so well. Now music where they especially worked well with, with stuff that's recorded maybe with less bass than is ideal, you know there's some old pop, uh, there's some old jazz, you know, there's even some modern stuff which is kind of a little bit bass light and that's where it filled things in nicely. Uh, for example, you know, in jazz you have like the cello the, you know, and uh, jazz fusion, you have the bass, you know. That bass line, would, when it could fill that in and it could make that old music really entertaining. And there's stuff like, uh, for example, there's uh, one of my favourite tracks is from Judy, Judy Driscoll and she sings The Doors Light My Fire. Now this was an interesting track I found because of an audio writer used to take this into audio shows and uh, you know, you take it into a manufacturer's room and they put it on and people will go, holy cow, who is this singer? And it was this uh, old and now fairly unknown singer. And it was really brilliant, but it was just mastered with very little bass and these help fill that out nicely. Now, of course, being a mixed blessing, you know, some things like Coltrane that already has a very strong cello in there, that could be a bit overwhelming. Uh, but some modern stuff I like, like Dead Can Dance, you know, you kind of end up having two choices. It's it, Dead Can Dance is really brilliant music, and, and Spirit Chaser album is, you know, kind of an, uh, the, the, their penultimate album before they split up, but there's a lot of stuff in there, like the, the deep rumble of didgeridoos, and there's a lot of instruments in there, and some great vocal you get great vocals in there. And that rumble of the, some of the instruments, like the didgeridoo, came out really well with the Cascades. Now, given that it has such a strong bass, and somewhat of a strong treble, it ends up with something of a V-shape, and that pushes the mid-range back somewhat. So compared to something like, for example, the uh, Mastrop Focal Alex, you know, with the, with the Dead Can Dance, this brought out the rumble of the, the instruments, in the rumble of the bass instruments, whereas this brought out the vocals more, being more of a flat kind of tuning. Similarly, the, the Mr. Speaker's Eon Flow and Eon Flow Open, they also are kind of more flat tuning, or they're, they're a little bit on the warm side, especially with some of the inserts in there, and they sort of strike a balance between that. Now, the more on the kind of cascade kind of sound is the Sony MDR Z7s. Now, the Z7s aren't as nice sounding as the Cascades in many ways. They, they have a little bit of harshness in, in the mids and treble. And the thing that I liked about the Cascades is that they don't. The mids and treble quality, even if the mids are pushed back a bit, inserts or no inserts, filters or no filters, is that it's just so good. And I think that's partly why they scale up so well. I mean, I could, I've been using them with some, a variety of amps, you know, the usual suspects I have up here, the Studio 6 uh, uh, Solaris and Master 9. I've also got in some new amps, the uh, IFI Pro ICANN and the uh, SoundAware P1. And I could really make out the difference between the quality of, uh, the, and the uh, delivery of all these amps with the Cascade, which was quite good. And that's one of the reasons I, I kind of wish if they'd be made, you know, with a wider headband, and uh, you know what bigger cups like a full size regular full size pair of headphones they would be really excellent as well speaking of that once you get them on your head obviously they have smaller cups and the narrow headband that the headband pushes down a bit and the clamping is fairly tight something which is offset by these you know really soft and and comfortable pads and so i did find listening could be sometimes a little bit uncomfortable especially on the top of my head where it presses down there but otherwise i did manage to listen with them for a while but if you do not like strong clamping headphones, then you might find these somewhat uncomfortable. And you know, this is again, like this steel does clamp pretty well. 
but it was just the cleanliness of the mids and treble which made them so good to listen with. Now of course that treble can be tuned down somewhat and I found myself tuning it down more than I expected with the 12 micrometer filter and I think that was interesting because normally I find that the Mr. Speakers are now a little bit too dark for me in tuning but once I got used to listening with these then switching to the Mr. Speakers at least the treble was about spot on. Now there was a funny thing about that I was listening to Dead Can Dance and I was listening with the Cascades and switched to the Eon Flow and it's like the big drop off in bass it was like where's the bass gone? It's just a, like it completely disappeared, well not completely disappeared but uh, considerably disappeared so it actually affected how I listened for a while. Now speaking a bit more of that bass and, and the kind of sound stage Isolation isn't really amazing. I mean, we're probably speaking uh, without having them here, kind of like uh, the old Fostex uh, slash Denon kind of isolation. You're still going to hear a fair bit of noise that out and around you. They're not going to isolate really, really well, especially in nothing like a pair of noise cancelers. But I mean, they, they do the job sufficiently, and they're not going to leak tons of noise. And I, I can't really demonstrate that readily because I have to. I'd have to cover over the cup. Usually, I can just push the cups together, but with these, like, these I can't. I can't push them together close enough to demonstrate that well. But with simpler music, such as you know your basic jazz stuff, where there isn't a fair minimum of instruments, the soundstage does get really wide, which seems to defy the you know their kind of small size. So things like Chesky binaural could sound really wide, things like old jazz could sound really wide, and even classical could sound really wide. Now going back to our good old Spirit Chaser again, you know a lot of the tracks in there start out simply with just instruments, and you kind of hear them around. But when the, the uh, tracks become complex, especially a lot of modern music which is compressed, even even moderately. Then when things got loud, things could get a little bit crowded in here. And I don't think it's the drivers. The driver quality seems to be excellent. You know, it seems to very much delineate out each of the instruments really well, even when things get busy. I think it's just because you have small cups in this small space with sound bouncing around that things could end up sounding quite busy when the tracks became quite busy. And although it seems that they seem to keep to together quite well, maybe with only the tiniest bit of harshness somewhere in the mid-range appearing occasionally, but in generally speaking, you know, I found them very easy to listen with for long periods, especially with the uh, one or another of the filters in. Now I said earlier in the video I owned a pair of Ultrasone Edition 9s modified by Ken Ball at ALO Audio. Now Ken, of course, liked those headphones, and at the same time I owned the Denon D5000s, which had a very kind of similar sound signature. Now if you've heard the, uh, well there were the Fostex OEM Denons, they've kind of been superseded by the Fostex TH900, and they're nice cans as well, but the, you know, the treble tends to be a little bit harsh, and you know, you kind of wish they were a little bit smoother sounding, and they do seem to have limits on how much detail they'll retrieve, especially for a $1,500 pair of headphones. So I tried the Ultrasound Edition 9s, but I found they're a little bit bland and dull sounding, and I think really the kind of headphones I wanted were what these are. And from when I want a pair of non-neutral, really kind of bass thumping headphones, these really seem to hit the spot. They've got good quality treble, good quality mids, albeit somewhat recessed, but they've got that bass thump that fills in a lot of music and makes them really entertaining to listen with. Sure, they're quite the most comfortable, you know, there's some little niggles in there, like the, as I said, the headband, and they can become a little bit crowded sounding when the music does become complex, but they're such an enjoyable pair of headphones to listen with that I still find myself grabbing them to listen with them quite often. Now, if you think about it, the Ultrasone Edition 9s, they were $1,500 new, and round, that works out around about $2,000 in today's money. If you think that these are less than half the price of that, I think this is when people complaining about the cost of new flagships coming out, which are you know more and more and more expensive, the the quality of sound is coming down in price, which is really fantastic. And this is a perfect example of those. And what's more, you can put them in a case and take them with you very easily. So in the end, I think these are really the headphones that I wish I'd had. You know, when I had the got the the Sony's, the Ultrasones, the Denons, all of those, the the kind of bass strong headphone that make a lot of makes a lot of music very entertaining. These are the headphones I wish I had back then. So thanks once again for watching. If you did enjoy it, give us a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more, subscribe. Would you like to see the videos days or weeks before I've made them? If you can afford to do the equivalent of buying me a cup of coffee once in a while, do consider signing up for my Patreon. You do get access to the chat. You can see my opinions, ask me questions, be involved and chat to me in general, ask for advice, and actually see a lot of the videos before they are released to the public. Also, don't forget to check out my website. You can just go to it by typing here.reviews in your web browser. And also, if you do want to help me out in other ways, if not the Patreon, if you buy your headphones through the links on the sidebar, that sends a few dollars my way and helps me make these videos as I do not allow manufacturers to pay for reviews. So thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.